afternoon. Welcome to the Ava Gardner Museum. My name is Lynelle Siebel, and I am the museum director. We are located in the heart of downtown Smithfield, North Carolina, and we have over 5,000 square feet of exhibit space. Here you will learn about Ava's childhood, family, career, and loves. You might wonder why a museum dedicated to a world famous movie star is located in a small town in North Carolina. Ava Lavinia Gardner was born in the small farming community of Grabtown, about seven miles outside of Smithfield, and she always considered this area her home. In fact, it was Ava's idea to have the original collection, then owned by Tom and Lorraine Banks, displayed here in Smithfield. Ava also requested to be buried with her family members at Sunset Memorial Park, which is located less than a mile from here. We want you to know the real Ava Gardner, and I'm happy to share some of our exhibits and artifacts with you today. And I hope if you have any memories of Ava or her films, you will also share those with us. If you do have any questions, please feel free to type them, and we will be happy to answer all of your questions at the end of the tour. First, I would like to introduce two people that are very involved in the museum and are here to help show you around. Laura Stocker is a member of the Ava Gardner Museum Board of Directors and is also a big classic film fan, fan. She is our expert when it comes to films of that era. Ashby Bream is the Director of Marketing at the Johnston County Visitors Bureau, which is a huge supporter of our museum. And Ashby is our local expert on Johnston County and the town of Smithfield. Ashby's now going to share you some information about Ava's early years. So as Linnell mentioned, Ava was born and raised near Smithfield, North Carolina, located at exit 95 off Interstate 95 and close to the state capital of Raleigh here in eastern North Carolina. Smithfield is a growing area with a rich agricultural heritage and is located in the county of Johnston which locals affectionately refer to as Joko. So welcome to Joko. I hope you get to visit us in Ava someday. Now in this case here, you'll see the Gardner Family Bible on which Ava's birthday is recorded. She's the very last one on the list down there at the bottom. Ava enthusiasts might notice that her birth year is incorrect, recorded as December 24th, 1923, not 1922, when Ava's birth certificate tells us she was in fact born. We assume that a family member took the time to write Ava's Christmas Eve birthday down a few weeks later and mistakenly wrote the new year of 1923. Now, did any of you know the story of how Ava was discovered? As you can see from this picture here, Ava was discovered when she went to visit her sister Beatrice, who the family called Bathy. Beatrice's husband, Tari, Larry Tarr, took a picture of her and hung it in the window of his New York City photography studio. That's the picture that you're, you see here on the right. A legal clerk who worked for Lowe's Theater saw Ava's picture and wanting to ask her out on a date, posed as a talent scout to ask about her. The trick didn't work, but his attempt did inspire Larry and Bappy to send Ava's portrait to MGM. The studio was so impressed by Ava's stunning looks that they granted her a screen test on the spot. And you can see Ava pictured with Bappy um, at the top there. Now, after seeing this screen test, Louis V. Mayer, who was the head of MGM at the time, signed Ava to a standard contract. So in 1941, at age 18, Ava left North Carolina and moved to Hollywood with her sister, Bappy, accompanying her as a chaperone. As you can see here, Ava's first several years in Hollywood were filled with pinup photo shoots and small film roles.
Now, something that also happened Ava's first year in Hollywood is that she was courted by and eventually married a very persistent Mickey Rooney. Later in life, Ava would go on to share marriages with Artie Shaw and Frank Sinatra. Now, her marriage to Mickey was brief. It only lasted about a year. And at the end of that marriage, um, Ava also had to face the untimely death of her mother. But after that, she continued to work steadily through her first five years in Los Angeles. And her big break finally came in 1946, which Laura is going to speak about next. As Ashby mentioned, Ava spent the first five years of her time under contract at MGM, working in really small bit roles, which were often uncredited. In the year 1956, she was loaned out to other studios for two films, a January release from United Artists called Whistle Stop, and an August release from Universal Studios called The Killers. Her home studio of MGM was paid $1,000 per week for her loan outs while Ava made just $50 per week under her standard studio contract. Although her salary was low, her stellar performances in these two films marked a turning point in her career and set her on the path to becoming an A-list star. As the quintessential femme fatale Kitty Collins in The Killers, Ava achieved one of her most iconic looks ever on film, wearing a one-shouldered black satin gown created by Vera West, the head costume designer at Universal Studios. In 2018, the Ava Gardner Museum commissioned North Carolina-based designer Danielle Wiggins to painstakingly recreate this iconic black dress, which continues to inspire fashion today. The Killers was the first of three roles Ava would play in films adapted from the works of Ernest Hemingway. The other films were 1952's The Snows of Kilimanjaro and 1957's The Sun Also Rises. Of all the films made from his work, Hemingway thought The Killers was the best, and he often screened the film in his home. This commemorative leather-bound script, engraved with Ava's name, was given to her after wrapping The Killers' production. Linnell will now share with you another costume in the museum's permanent collection. This safari jacket, created by Oscar-winning costume designer Helen Rose, is from the 1953 film La Gambo, which Ava co-starred with Clark Gable and Grace Kelly. An interesting story about this film is when Ava was a child, her mother Molly would sometimes take her to the movies in Smithfield, especially one starring Clark Gable, who was Molly and Ava's favorite actor. It was here in 1932 that they saw the film Red Dust, starring Gable and Jean Harlow, and a young Ava vowed to someday act in a movie with him. Years later, that film was remade as Magambo, with Ava now starring opposite Clark in the role Jean Harlow had played in Red Dust. Magambo was the third film starring Ava Gardner and Clark Gable, 
They previously co-starred in The Hucksters in 1947 and Lone Star in 1952. Many people may not know that Ava was actually nominated for an Academy Award for Best Actress for her role as Eloise Honey Bear Kelly in Magambo. Here we have the certificate that she was given by the Academy to commemorate her nomination in 1954. Ultimately, she did not win. Audrey Hepburn won for her role in Roman Holiday, which she starred in opposite Gregory Peck, who was a great friend of Ava's. Greg, as Ava called him, and Ava had already starred in two movies together by this time, and they started a close friendship that would last for the rest of her life. Now, Ashby and Laura will share with you some more information about movies with Gregory and Ava. This is our gallery of movie posters starring Ava, with many more hung throughout the museum. As we move along the gallery, do you see your favorite Ava film? As Linnell mentioned, Ava and her mother used to watch movies at the Howe Theater in downtown Smithfield. When Ava's movie, The Great Center, which you can see here, her first with Gregory Peck, was released in the summer of 1949, the Howe hosted a premiere screening of the movie. Though Ava could not attend the screening due to her filming schedule, she sent a thank you letter to the theater's owners, which is now in the museum's archives. Today, visitors to downtown Smithfield can still see a film at the Howe which remains a working movie theater. Ava also starred in two other movies with Gregory, The Snows of Kilimanjaro and On the Beach. He signed this poster of On the Beach during a visit to the museum. It says, a gloomy film, but Ava at her best, Gregory Peck. As Ashby and Linnell shared, Ava Gardner and Gregory Peck became great friends after working together in three films. They actually first met in 1947 when they both received awards from Look Magazine. Of Ava, Peck would once say that he loved her like a sister and that she was always his favorite leading lady. We're fortunate enough to have two costumes used in the Great Center in the museum's permanent collection. This ornate fur trim jacket was originally designed for Ingrid Bergman's lead role in the 1944 film, Irene. It was designed by Irene Lentz, the head costume designer at MGM Studios. 
Irene later reworked this piece for Ava to wear as Paulina Strofsky in The Great Center. This is a sketch by Irene showing what her full costume looked like that she designed for Ingrid Bergman's role in Gaslight. We're often asked at the museum, how tall was Ava Gardner? What was her shoe size? What were her measurements? Well, this dress, also from the Great Center, which is black velvet, uh, truly illustrates just how small of a waist she had. She was 26 at the time of filming the Great Center, and this dress has a waist size of 18 inches. Additionally, Ava was 5'6 in height and wore a six and a half shoe. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about this beautiful cape that we have on display. It's one of our most photographed items in the museum. In 1954, Ava starred in The Barefoot Contessa. She played the role of doomed beauty Maria Vargas, a fiercely independent woman who goes from unknown Spanish dancer to international film star. It's one of her most well-known roles and one that embodies her own rise from an unknown North Carolina college student to a famed Hollywood actress. The Italian fashion designers, the Fontana sisters, created Ava's extensive wardrobe for the Barefoot Contessa, which included 23 pairs of shoes and numerous dresses and other costume changes. This cape is made of silk and it includes intricate gold thread and floral embroidery and sequins. While this item didn't appear in the final cut of the film, it was used in a series of well-known publicity shots for the movie. The film, The Barefoot Contessa, begins with the title character's funeral scene, and then her story untolds, is, unfolds in flashback. Locals who attended Ava's real 1990 funeral in Smithfield say that they were reminded of that opening sequence from The Barefoot Contessa because the weather and atmosphere were eerily similar on the day of her funeral. Ten years after completing The Barefoot Contessa, Ava starred alongside Richard Burton and Deborah Carr in another classic movie, The Night of the Iguana. Linnell would now like to tell you about one of the museum's artifacts from that film's production. My favorite artifact is from the film, The Night of the Iguana, but it's not really from the movie itself. This item was a gift from the film's director, John Huston, with so many big stars involved in the in the film's production, Houston wanted to diffuse any tension that might arise on the set. So he gave each of them a gun and a set of bullets engraved with the names of the other co-stars, the producer, and even Elizabeth Taylor, who was there with her husband, Richard Burton. John Houston did not, however, have his own name engraved on any of the bullets. Now, during filming in Mexico, the stars were taken to the set via boat or even on a yacht. But as you can see from this photo, Ava preferred to water ski to the set. I often get asked what my favorite Ava Garden, or Gardner movie is, and that's a tough question to answer. She played many different types of roles in many movies. And at the beginning of her career, she was often portrayed as the femme fatale, sexy and mysterious. But I think my favorite role of hers is Maxine, because people who truly knew her have shared with me that the role of Maxine Falk was very much like the real Ava. Ava was down to earth, extremely loyal, had a great sense of humor, and never took herself too seriously. And you can really see that side of Ava in this photo where she is just being herself, barefoot and casual, just like Ava was during her visits home to North Carolina. Ava was nominated for a, a Golden Globe, excuse me, in 1965 as Best Actress for her role in The Night of the Iguana.
we are very lucky to have a large collection of Bert Pfeiffer portraits here at the Ava Gardner Museum. And this particular portrait was clearly inspired by Ava's role as Maxine Falk. Bert Pfeiffer was a Dutch artist who never actually met Ava, but after seeing her in the movie One Touch of Venus in 1948, he proceeded to paint a portrait of her almost every year until his death in 2001. We now own 33 of those portraits, including the three that Ava personally chose to hang in her London apartment. Now Laura's going to show you an artifact from another MGM movie. This lovely dress was created for Ava's role as Isabel Lorison in the 1949 romantic drama from MGM called East Side, West Side. It has a coordinating shawl, a belt that matches the fabric, as well as buttons around the back that also include the same fabric overlay. It was designed by Helen Rose, who was the same costume designer for Magambo. A fun fact about the film East Side, West Side, the same composer from The Killers was also the composer for this film. His name was Miklos, Miklos Rocha, and he was an Oscar-winning composer who did the score for Ben-Hur. These are some additional posters from the museum's collection. As I previously mentioned, Ava Gardner starred in three films adapted from the works of Ernest Hemingway. When he sold the rights to his work, The Sun Also Rises, he requested Ava Gardner play the lead role of Lady Brett Ashley because he was so impressed by her performance in the two previous films based off his writings. These two linen suits were designed by Charles Lemaire for the film's 1957 production. Now Ashby will share with you some information about the special exhibits in our library. This is the library, which houses a collection of books about Ava's life and career, as well as books from Ava's personal library, including leather bound editions of several of her film scripts. This is a photo from MGM's Silver Anniversary Gathering. Here you can see Ava photographed with many of her contemporaries. They were seated alphabetically, so beside her you'll see Clark Gable, and then on the other side, Miss Judy Garland.
Also in the library is the Frank Sinatra and Ava Gardner exhibit. A favorite for many visitors, Frank and Ava were the loves of each other's lives and remained good friends till Ava's death in 1990. As Linnell mentioned at the beginning of our tour, Ava is buried alongside her family in Sunset Memorial Park, just one mile from the museum. Many people think that Sinatra paid for her funeral, which is not true. He did, however, send a bouquet of her favorite flower, yellow roses, with a card that said, All My Love, Francis. The card is currently part of the museum's collection. Our newest exhibit, which you can see here, includes these wall displays and our very first interactive digital exhibit called Ava, My Real Story. This exhibit highlights who Ava was away from the glare of celebrity, her love of friends, family, and animals, her dislike of the media and the Hollywood contract system, and her lifelong commitment to philanthropy. Visitors to the museum can click through the exhibit, seeing quotes from Ava, her contemporaries, as well as photos from Ava's life. This concludes our walkthrough of the Ava Gardner Museum. Linnell, Laura, and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have about the tour you've seen today, and thank you so much for joining us.